you purchase goods and services every day Mo most days probably multiple goods and services per day and what you probably don't do is go into each of these stores or go online and try to barter with Amazon try to say well I'll, I'll give you one of the books that I own in exchange for some razors or something like that instead what we do what we kind of what we do without even thinking is we take our money we take the dollar bills that we have in our bank account through our debit card or through the dollars that we physically have the coins that we physically have and we use that money to barter we use that money to purchase goods and services that really is the is the heart of what we do every single day and it's the heart of economics but we don't spend a lot of time thinking about it because it's so natural to us when we think about the monetary system the monetary system is really made up of two parts it's the money that we are using to finance operations within the economy and it's also the institutions that regulate that for the united states that is the federal reserve and we're going to spend some time talking about the federal reserve but before we do that i want to talk here a little bit more about the money within an economy these dollar bills that we have in our pockets or in our bank accounts most likely what you're using to purchase things there's two different ways that we can set up our monetary system the first is that it could be backed by commodities and those commodities could be gold it could be silver there's a number of things over history that governments have or that, that governments have used to back their dollar bills or to back their their money supply uh, in America we were backed by gold and silver uh, basically up until 1971 for gold silver uh, basically before the Civil War and we moved away from that you might actually think that our dollars are backed by some sort of commodity it, kind of because mostly because of the amount that we talk about the gold standard in our in our past but that's not actually how we have how we have set up our currency our currency is actually a fiat currency and most developed nations use fiat currencies and they do it because that means that the government is the sole backer that that currency is is backed it is provided by the full faith and credit of that government in America the United States dollars are in fact only valuable because the United States government says that they're valuable and we have faith that that government is going to be around and will honor the debts and will honor the, that legal tender and so if I give someone a dollar bill that dollar bill is is, is equally as valuable to me as it is to that person that I exchange that dollar bill with for a good or a service there's a few reasons that that is very important and I've listed them out here the first thing that we think about with money what is money when we think about it I'll just list it here so that we can kind of keep everything straight money first and foremost must be a medium of exchange so it must be a transferable item that's used in trade to purchase a good and service over the history of human nature we have had different types of money I mean money has been fish it has been stones it has been all types of things uh, it has been actual blocks of gold it has been actual silver coins and it has been dollar bills right it has been kind of these bills that actually are not backed by anything when we think about that medium of exchange the important part is that it must be transferable and it must be accepted by individuals right so that transferability is an incredibly important part of money of what makes money viable within an economy the second thing we think about is the unit of account it must be a common point of economic comparison so we could say right I mean we uh, I don't know we could say that a microwave is worth a certain number of cups but we don't talk about things like that we typically talk about prices right and we talk about prices in America in terms of dollars and that gives us some unit of account that is able to we can compare things very easily that that ease that common point of economic comparison is crucial when we think about money money is also right the third thing that money must be is it must also be a store of value and the key here is that it must be a constant transfer of value from right now to the future time period so I had said previous 
previous um, countries and pre and previous uh, regimes over the kind of history of of the world have used different types of things as money. They've used stones. One of the things that a stone would do is it would continue to be a store of value, except that you could chip it or you could break it. And you've also had economies that have used things like fish before. And you can think about fish might be a good ex medium of exchange because, I don't know, you can put it in a burlap, burlap sack and carry it around. And it is a unit of account. You could say, well, everything's, everything is worth X number of fish. However, the thing that it would be bad at is a store of value, which is you could have that fish today. However, it's, it is likely going to go bad very quickly. And you probably won't carry around a decaying carcass of a fish for all that long. And so it would it, the, the money that you would have, that medium of exchange, would totally vanish over time. And so one of the last things that money must have is it must be a constant store of value from one time period to the next. When we think about money, there's a few different things that kind of go into it. And I want to bring up here real quick, I've gone out to the Federal Reserve and I've taken some of the data. We're going to be talking a lot about the Federal Reserve here, but before we jump into that, I want to talk a little bit about different things that we count as money. And here I've pulled up a little bit of data on M1 and M2. And we're going to kind of go into the different pieces here, but as we were talking about money, what we talk about with M, this is just uh, kind of a, this is a stand-in for money. So these are different ways that we measure money in the economy. And the main way that we measure money in the economy is currency. It's what we think about on a daily basis. And the chart that we're looking at is breaking out money into two different categories. The first category is M1, which is currency, which in sometimes on different books you will see currency listed as M0. But currency is just exactly that, right? It's the dollar bills, it's the coins, it's the digital currency that exists in everyone's bank accounts that we that exist across the economy. Currency makes up the vast majority of this M1, of these blue lines for each of these years. And these years go from 1959 all the way to 2014, So, and this is by month as well. So we've got uh, a lot of monthly data uh, in here as well. And we're looking at real dollar values. So we can kind of compare this over time, and we can see on real dollar values the currency and the vast majority of this M1 is currency. It has basically stayed relatively constant over the last 50 to 60 years. There's a few other things that are counted in M1. So one, it's the money that we have. And two, there's a few different ways that we can keep that money, right? We can keep that money in dollar bills and in coins in our dresser or in our pockets. But most of the time, we take that money and we put it into some sort of checking account. It's a checking account that does not give us interest, right? You just put it into account, you give it to a bank, and then that bank says, great, I will hold on to this, and you can come and get it anytime you want. And so when we talk about demand and checking deposits, that is also counted as M1, as the base level of money. And we've also got traveler's checks here. Uh, there's a couple other small items that count in M1, but one of the main things that we're thinking about here is that this is the most liquid. And when we talk about liquidity in the economy, we're specifically talking about the ease with which an asset can be converted into the economy's medium of exchange. M1 are the most liquid items that we have, the most liquid assets. And so these are the things that you can easily get your hands on and give to someone else, right? So this is kind of just the money that we have generally in the economy. There's, a, there's other values of money that we consider as well, and that's what we call kind of that next level up M2. And M2, as you can imagine, as we kind of go level up, we are getting towards things that are a little less liquid. So I would say here that M2 is kind of a medium level of liquidity or less liquid. And so when we talk about these types of things, M2 and here the red bars are only these things here. So the red bar, if we just combine all this together, M1 plus M2, the top of this 
curve would be showing us M1 plus M2, the total money supply in the economy in real dollars. But if we're looking at kind of what constitutes M2, well, it's all of these things in M1. It's the currency, it's the checking uh, accounts that we have, and then it's also the savings accounts that we have, the money market mutual funds like treasury bills. These are the treasury bills that mature in less than one year. So short-term government bills uh, that we've talked about, bonds that we've talked about, and kind of small level deposits. So under, under $100,000 in like certificates of deposit, those types of things. And you can start to see here what I'm talking about with liquidity, which is your savings account you mostly have access to. You can basically put money into a bank, into a savings account, and for the most part in an American economy today, you can then withdraw that money anytime you want. However, there's a few things here where we're starting to get into kind of short term. So these would be things where you could withdraw them. You put the money into an account and it's, it's kind of tied up for about a year uh, or maybe some period that's a little bit less than a year. But you have a little less uh, ease of access to getting that money back out. So you can invest in a treasury bill that's maybe a six month treasury bill and there's a market for it. You can sell it, but you can, you, if you don't sell it, you must also hold on to it for six months. If you get a certificate of deposit from a bank, it's going to, it's going to pay you a little higher interest rate than your savings account would. And in exchange for that, the bank is going to say you can't take out that money. You can't redeem that certificate of deposit for the term of that deposit, for example, six months. And so the bank can then use that money without the fear of you taking the money back out. So all of this to say, in our economy, we think about money in a number of different ways. It gets used in a number of different ways. When we think about it in general, we wanna think about the main things, medium of exchange, unit of account, store of value. But we also wanna think about what constitutes money here as well. And here I hope that this also helps give you a feel for kind of the supply of money over time where we've seen a, a larger increase in the real amount of money that exists in our economy. We're gonna start thinking about things in this type of way moving forward as we talk about monetary policy in macroeconomics.